<clears throat> so welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Um, I'm delighted to have my friend Rob Trasinski. Um, when I got fascinated by this topic of language, uh, let me just tell you a little bit about why I'm doing this on language. I went through these great books uh, of the Western world and they've identified these 103 ideas around which the Western conversation revolves. And of all those 103 ideas, language is the one that I found incredibly fascinating. I've done four meetups on it already uh, over the last four years, and I want to do more. And um, my friend Rob knows more about language than anybody I know. So I said, okay, I have to talk to Rob. And normally what happens is that I have, um, you know, I, 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 let me tell you two stories about Rob and language. Uh, so he's, uh, you know, when I met his mom and I would remark to her about uh, his capacity in language, she, she said, you know what? He did not speak for a long time. And when he spoke, he spoke in full sentence. He, the first sentence was, please pass me the potatoes. Uh, so uh, that's, that's, that's one story. The other story is that I, I go and visit him and his family for Thanksgiving all the time. And, um, and he's a syndicated columnist, so he has to write his columns. So sometime in the middle of the festivities, uh, he will say, okay, I have to go write my column. I said, Rob, what are you going to write about? He said, I don't know yet. And he goes into this room study and one hour or one and a half hour that it comes out and plops this on in front of me, which is just this incredible, long, complex, deep article which is very engaging so somehow he manages he knows something about language that i don't know i don't know so i said okay i have to talk to rob about this so that's a brief introduction to rob uh so what we're going to do is that we're going to do um free-flowing conversation i'm going to just talk to rob normally what happens is that when i go there his kids take me over so i don't get time to spend with rob and um usually after the best conversation is when we go pick you up at the airport or the train station, we're coming back. That's when we get the best conversation and then the kids take over. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But then at late at night, if he's alive, you know, awake, <laughs> then we have these long conversations. So right. I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm, I want to make it one of conversations like this. And then, you know, please keep on asking your questions in chat and we'll come to the questions by and by. Okay. So we're going to start with the Question. So what I've done is that um, I've kind of looked through everything that everybody has said about language, all these great thinkers, you know, philosophers, scientists, um, novelists, uh, historians, psychologists, and I've been collecting all these questions. So I've given all the questions to Rob. And so we're going to go through kind of core questions on language that I've, I've come across. And we're just going to go uh, and have a conversation about that. So Rob, do you want to say anything before we start, or shall I just jump in and start? Well, I'll just say my, you know, say my, I, my knowing a lot about language. I'm not a linguist. I'm not a, an anthropologist who studied the origins of language, but my knowledge is I'm a guy who, you know, words are my business. I, I use words for a living. I use language for a living. And uh, it's, that's, that's the, the knowledge of how to, how to use words, how to put words together, what words do for you in your own mind. Is, is what I really want to talk about today. So, so go ahead and start out. Absolutely, okay. So let's start with, you know, I'm a big fan of Louis Sullivan. So let's start with the function of language. What yeah. does language do? What does language do intellectually, emotionally, socially? What's the function of language? Well, I, I, in my view, language originated primarily with, a, or, or at least the impetus for it, the motivation for it was a social function. The ability to communicate to others, communicate knowledge to others, communicate your intentions to others, uh, make requests. Uh, that you know, the ability to communicate and coordinate the actions. You know, you have a small group of hunter gatherers wandering around. The ability to coordinate your actions. Uh, you know, we want to talk about language, by the way. I'm also a big Star Trek fan, so we have to talk about one of my favorite, probably my my single favorite Star Trek episode, which is one called Dharma. I've heard, this is 1991, September 1991, I think it was, fifth season, something like the first or second episode. And it's one of these crazy things where Star Trek, had, you know, this is the next, Star Trek The Next Generation, had been tremendously successful, so, so successful, they were basically able to do whatever they wanted and get these ideas that you could imagine the network suits would fall over 
and say you can't possibly do that if they actually pitch them. So this was one where, you know, in, in Star Wars, in Star Trek, they always have this universal translator that says you can communicate. And it's basically to explain why everybody in the entire galaxy speaks English, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, of course, the reason they speak English is it's a television show, and you want the audience to be able to understand everybody. You don't want to have to go through this rigmarole so everybody speaks English. But they came up with the universal translator as, as the explanation of that. And this is one where they said, well, what if they encountered somebody who uses a language so radically different from ours that we can't, the, the universal translator doesn't work and we can't understand them at all? And so you have this thing where Picard and this, the, the, the captain of this other alien spaceship, you know, they're sort of on the brink of hostilities that are trying to make some connection between each other. They beam down to the, to the planet, to the surface of the planet that they're around. And it turns out this, this, the, other, uh, the other starship captain has this idea that they will face a common enemy together. And in, and in working together to defeat the common enemy, this, this, this beast, this sort of strange alien beast that's there, in working together for that purpose, they will then be able to figure out how to communicate and how to understand each other. And that's exactly what happened. So it's, it's a really, you know, it's, it's very high-minded um, uh, humanism that we uh -huh. expect from, you know, the Star Trek uh, um, franchise. But it, it, it highlights this idea of the communicative function of language, the, the coordinating function of language, that, to, that people working, it allows the small groups of people in a dangerous and hostile environment, which is where we all were 10, 20,000 years ago, it allows them to work together and to communicate their intentions and to be able to cooperate. But I think that the more fascinating thing about language is what it does intellectually, what it does for you inside your own head. And uh, you know, I, I think it's interesting that language probably developed in order to be able to communicate our thoughts to each other. But then once it develops, there's this tremendous intellectual takeoff that human beings have. And I think that's because not only does it allow this coordination with each other, the transmission of knowledge, it's also allowing something to happen inside your own brain that wasn't possible before. Now, I, I'm taking, of course, some of this from Ayn Rand and a lot of it from my own personal experiences <laughs> confirming that, that she talked about the, the function of words of language as being to take your thoughts and solidify them, to make them concrete, to make it possible to retain them in an exact form. So if you say table, you, know, you have a word that stands for a specific thing uh, that sort of freezes that thought in place as here's a specific concept with a specific meaning that I can then retain by having a word that stands for it. And that would, you know, it, it, if you didn't have words, the differentiation between table versus chair or table versus furniture, all that was sort of vague and woozy and not as fixed as if you say, no, I have this word for this and this other word for that allows me to, to, to freeze and keep in my mind the differentiation between those two ideas and those two kinds of things, whether it's something that's less you know, more general versus less general, or one type of thing versus another type of thing. It, it freezes those things, gives them a concrete reality that makes them, uh, you know, if you're using language properly, makes them more exact in your own head. And that's something that totally connects to my experience as a writer. Let me, let me, let me, let me uh, ask kind of more uh, elaboration on this. Sure. So is it, what you're saying is that you're observing concretes and you're observing patterns in con con right. uh, concretes. And the process of observing patterns and noticing patterns and what different kinds of things do, all that work is kind of summarized in a concrete word. Mm -hmm. so, so you're kind of storing up the result of all that processing. Yeah. Um, yes. And then from then on, when you kind of think of the word, in that one stroke with that one concrete, all that advantage of having done all those observations come to you. Yeah. And humans so it's are, kind of are, leverages. Mm -hmm. Humans are, you know, our brains are pattern recognizing machines. That's, we're, we're enormously good at, we're so good at it that, you know, the, was it uh, the, the failure of self-driving cars is one of the most interesting stories, I think, because 
You were, we were supposed to have self-driving cars in 2018. They're still working on it. And that's because human beings, for all our faults and imperfections and, you know, all the, you know, if you drive around, you can see, boy, people are really terrible drivers. Well, we're a thousand times better still than the, than the most sophisticated machines because of that pattern recognizing ability and, you know, that ability to, to you know, they're still having trouble with the machines. They can't tell, well, if the roads are wet or if there's snow, how do I tell where the road is? And all these things like that that we just do automatically with this amazing ability. So we are, we are, our brains are pattern recognition machines that are way beyond anything, any artificial machine we've been able to create yet. And so, but the thing is those pat, you know, you, it, we're really good at recognizing the patterns, but then you need to be able to store them. You need to be able to say, here's this pattern over here, as opposed to this pattern over here, you need a label. You need something that sticks there as a label that will recall to your mind exactly this kind of pattern or this kind of relationship among objects that I've noticed, all these objects are alike in a certain way. Let me capture that by putting a word on it, right? So um, or put the word uh, uh, mammoth, you know? So mammoth is my word for these big hairy things with long noses, right? And, uh, but you know, that, that's of course, you know, the first level, the easiest one is that you get finer and finer differentiations and you're able to put a label uh, a concrete label that will then capture here is this pattern, this type of thing. And it allows you to keep it and store it more exactly. And I was saying that as now, you know, fast forwarding to the mo modern level, as a writer, I experience this all the time because you're talking about, you know, having you asked me, what are you going to write about? Well, I'm not sure yet. It, what that really means is I've got a whole bunch of different ideas. I think there might be something interesting. You know, I've, I've been following the news on this latest event and I think there's, there's some interesting pattern, but I can't put it into words yet. And then I go into the other room and sit down and I, I put it into words. And that process of going from, I have a vague idea to putting it into words is always a, it's a really powerful intellectual thing because the vague idea I had at the beginning always ends up being a little different from what I end up with at the end because in the process of putting it into words, it has to become more concrete more specific, more exact. I have to decide, am I gonna use this word or that word with all the different shades of meaning there are, that are involved with that? And so you have to go from, I have a vague idea that something's happening out here to defining exactly what that thing is, exactly how it's different from other things. And you end up with something that is a far more complete thought, something far more well-developed, something far more concrete and a lot easier to retain in your head than the thing I had when I said, oh, I don't know what I'm going to write about. Yes. Um, so let me take it to the, to the next question because this leads naturally to the next question. Um, you said that language developed in essential, initially as a kind of a social tool, and then it became an intellectual tool. Looks like writing was a key part kind of that took it to a new level. So what is it? that distinguishes writing? What, what do you think kind of a historically, what did writing do that speaking could not do before? Yeah, that, that's interesting. Uh, well, I got a couple observations on it. One is writing takes that, that function of making something fixed and concrete, keeping, you know, putting the labels on to these file holders and allowing you to keep them straight. It takes that to a whole other level because it allows you to make them fixed uh, in, in concrete, literally in concrete reality, carved, well, you know, initially carved mm -hmm. into stone, right? That we have that phrase in our language. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's not carved into stone. Well, writing was carved into stone. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, you know, or, or scratched onto papyrus or whatever. But the idea is that because it's carved into stone, because it's set down and written down, you can refer back to it. Um, you know, an interesting thing is I was doing some uh, um, other meetup type events a while back on the book I just wrote. Last year, I published a book called So Who is John Galt Anyway, which is an analysis of Atlas Shrugged. And there was some discussion about Galt's speech. It's this giant speech that the hero gives uh, towards the end of the novel. And somebody was talking about how, you know, what would the, pointing out that it's kind of unrealistic for, you know, if you look at that as something that was supposed to be read over and listened to over the radio, you know, it would, it would take too long. It would be too hard to follow. And I said, yes, but she knew she was writing a novel. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> and she knew you know, if you look at the way Galt's speech is written, it's actually not written the way you would write it if you were going to speak it to somebody. 
it's written the way you would write it if, if you knew people were going to be reading it. Because when people are reading, they're able to go, um, you know, when somebody's talking, what they're saying sort of goes by really quickly and it flits by and you have to remember, wait, what did he say a few minutes ago? Whereas when you're reading, you set the pace as to how you take in the information. And you go by something and you say, wait a minute, I don't think I quite understood that. You, you scan back to it and you come over it. So there's a great deal more of sort of permanence to the ideas and the ability to the ideas being fixed and written down and carved into stone or etched onto paper. And then you have the ability to go over it in great, in much more, um, in much more detail and fix it down to a more precise formulation. Um, and I find that, you know, uh, now as a writer, it's strange. You know, I know some people who are extremely good speakers. I'm not nearly as good a speaker as I'm a writer because I've optimized myself for expressing myself in that medium. And, you know, the sort of thing where uh, I'll try three different words to say something, you know, to, to stress the same point, I'll try three or four different words and settle on the exact right word, which you can't do when you're speaking and which, you know, you can't even take in so as much when you're listening as when you're reading. Uh, another interesting observation about that. Now, like I said, I'm not a linguist, I'm not uh, an anthropologist who studies language, but there's a couple things historically I do know about the function of, of writing. Um, when I was studying ancient Greek, uh, way, way back in college, I had a professor who made a very interesting point. He talked about how there's a difference in the way uh, writing was used in ancient Greece. As you, notice, you can notice this difference. It happens right a little bit before the sort of golden age of ancient Greece. So we're in the earliest writings. Uh, there are, there's no use of contractions, you know, so like can't or isn't, you know, that would, it would be cannot and is not. And that's even more striking in Greek because in Greek and, and some other li similar languages, those contractions aren't really optional the way they are. You know, in, in English, a contraction is sort of a, a more informal version of, but the, you know, the more formal style of speaking would be cannot and is not. Uh, whereas in those languages, the contraction isn't really that optional because it's not so much a formal versus informal thing, but if you have like a word that ends in a vowel and a next word begins in the same vowel, you sort of have to drop one of the vowels and, and do the contraction. And up to a certain point, they never do that. They explain that the, the reason why they didn't do that is because the primary means of consuming ideas, of consuming words, was to, to speak them and to hear them. And a written uh, if you had something that's written out, it was written out as a guide to a person to perform it by speaking it to people who were then going to listen to it, right? So, and it's, it's more like the, the score of a piece of music, right? So if you, if I were hand you a piece of sheet music, now I read music, I'm not, even I, I'm pretty familiar with reading music, even I could not just hear the piece in my head by looking at the sheet of music. The sheet of music is there as a, as a guide for somebody to perform it and then you will listen to it, and that's how you'll experience the piece of music, right? You have to be very advanced. You know, they do this in the movies, whenever they show Mozart, you know, the uh -huh. piece of music, he looks at it, he hears the music playing. Very, very few people can do that. Well, his point was that was sort of what the written word was up to a certain point. It was a score used for the performer to use to then speak the words and other people would listen. And then he says, then there's a shift that happens where the contractions start showing up and there's a more conversational style of, of writing. And the shift is that people started doing what we do today and what we take for granted today, which is you read the sheet of paper, you know, reading becomes the primary means of experiencing words. And you read it and you, you, you experience the page of words as speaking to you directly uh -huh. without the need for anybody to perform it for you by speaking. I think that's a huge radical shift mentally that I think is underappreciated. The idea that a, uh, a set of words on the page is set down in permanent form could then speak to you. And that would be a, the, a primary means of communication because it gives that sort of permanence to the words and that level of exactness to the words that is a, you know, another step up from, from, you know, from nonverbal to verbal and then verbal to written, the fixed, precise, exact use of words, uh, I think is, is a radical change. On, on writing, I mean, my, my personal experience is kind of doing journaling. Um, I, just, I just moved recently and I found, discovered that I have 400 journals, like 40,000 pages written over the past 30 years. Yeah. 
And um, for me, what writing does is that writing is a way of being more self-aware of your thoughts. Mm -hmm. Because the moment you put something down on paper, you can look at it and say, okay, did I get it precisely enough? Am I yeah. missing something? Uh, how is it connected to this other thing that I put down? Um, so it's, it's a way of kind of become, making your thought more comprehensive, more self-aware, more precise. Um, and you can work on it iteratively. It is, you're kind of thinking about your thinking. Uh, so it yeah. gives you kind of one level of, um, kind of one more level of regulation of, of your thought. Yeah. Well, one, one, one other story on that that will probably amaze some people that I'm still married is, is when, <laughs> when Sherry was in graduate school, she was first started to do a lot of writing. I would, I would help edit her pieces and, and talk, you know, t talk to her about what she was writing and sort of teach that her. That was very brave of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the, it worked because she, you know, she did not think of herself as a writer. So she wasn't like offended if I said, oh, you, okay. you can change this. Okay. You know, if, if somebody has a lot of self-esteem, like I really like what I wrote and then somebody comes and criticizes yeah. it, that, that gets difficult. But there were times when I'd say, well, what are you thinking here? And we talked through what was the thinking process that she went into when she was writing something. And that's something that writing enables that. It enables you to see the process of your thinking. Literally, the process of your thinking has been etched down and drawn out on a sheet of paper. And you can see, oh, here was the way I was thinking. Here's how, the, here's how my thoughts were, were going one after another as I, was putting, as I was putting this together. And now I can introspect about that and, and it makes your thinking process itself more visible to you. And I've, I've seen it used, uh, or heard of it used in, uh, in psychology too, in psychotherapy and things like that, mm -hmm. where you know, if you write down what's going on and what you're thinking about things and what you're feeling about things, that makes it more real and makes it a lot easier for someone to, to grapple with that and introspect about it and not you know, skirt away from, oh my God, I actually said, you know, I actually wrote that down and said that. I guess I must actually think that or feel that, and now I have to under, now I have to confront why I think that, and is that am I correct about that? Excellent. So let me go to the next question, and that's on the role of metaphors in language. It's interesting you brought up Thermak and Angelat at Tanagra. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, what, what is the role of metaphors? You know how how does how does kind of things go from kind of connotation to denotation? So that's kind of a right. general topic. Go ahead. All right, well, yeah, so the, the Star Trek episode that I was talking about, which I think we have, you know, if you're talking about language, I actually, I, was, I wear that, I wear a t-shirt when I go work out at the gym, with, back when I went to the gym, so it's, I haven't been there in a long time, but because uh, of the, the virus, right? Um, but back when I, when I worked out at the gym, I, had, I wear a t-shirt that says Dharma Kanjalad at Tanagra, which is this phrase for that, you know, it's to find that little, episode, little overlap in the, the Venn diagram of, of people who are hardcore Star Trek fans and people who lift weights, right? And it's there, there's a group of people there. And my favorite one is, you know, like once a month, somebody will come up and stop me and say something about the shirt. And my favorite one is somebody, a lady comes up and she's a linguist, I think at University of Virginia. and says, that's my favorite Star Trek episode. And I'm like, well, if you were a linguist, that would definitely be your favorite <laughs> because, you know, since when is the nature of language itself, you know, the, the topic of the television show. Um, and in that, in that episode, the, the uh, whole idea, the reason why they have such difficulty communicating is these, this alien race, the Tamarians, have a language that's entirely metaphorical. So, you know, Picard is trying to say things like, we would like to have a treaty with you for uh, mutual cooperation. And, they, and they're the guy saying, Rai and Jiri at the crossroads. And it turns out, you know, this is some story from their mythology. And they think in terms entirely of metaphors and allusions to these stories. Um, and, you know, I wrote a whole piece about that a number of years ago saying, well, actually, when you think about it, we're not that different. And I see that a lot in our politics, right? That uh, our, you know, there was some, uh, I think James Clyburn, one of the, the member of Congress, was doing a sit-in on the floor of the House of Representatives. And I'm like, what do you mean you're doing a sit-in? You are a congressman. You have a right to sit there. But, you know, it made no sense literally but metaphorically, you could think of it in, you know, in this language that we get from the Star Trek episode, you could think of it as the bridge at Selma, right? He, he, he's evoking a metaphor or, you know, and a lot, of our, uh, 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 a lot of our political language is sort of like that. It, 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 it's speaking in terms of metaphors and uh, uh, these very loose metaphors, usually, mm -hmm. uh, right? You know, Nixon, when he went to China or, uh, 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 
Washington, that Valley Forge, you know, all these, all these things that are invoked uh, metaphorically to, 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 do, to do the business of thinking about politics for us. And that indicates the problem with metaphors is that metaphors are very powerful and, and you, know, you cannot write without using metaphors and making comparisons, but you also have to be very precise about what it is. Every time you use a metaphor, what it is that this metaphor means, what you're taking from this metaphor. Um, a metaphor is an implicit comparison. It's saying this thing is like that thing, right? Uh, this, you know, this John Bolton is like a bull in a china shop, right? So we think of a bull in a china shop, there's you know, certain aspects or characteristics of a bull in a china shop that you would take and you'd say, that's what applies to this person. So you have to be very clear about, well, when you use that metaphor, which parts apply and which parts are different. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of mischief happens when people don't, when people don't do that. Um, and that gets us to connotation versus denotation, a fascinating topic, I think. Uh, because I mean, the whole of a, a writer's art is sort of contained in that. Uh, so I used to do writing courses years ago, and one of the things I used to assign to um, my students is I would say to them, come up with as many different ways as you can of saying my opponent's position is, my opponent's argument is wrong, right? But not saying wrong, think of as many, come up with as many different words, different words you can think of to say the same, to say that, that would have a slightly different shade of meaning. So, you know, if you say my opponent is an error, that's a very polite and gentle way. You know, you're, you're not, there's no moral connotation to it. There's no, you're, you're not saying, you know, he's you're not disparaging his intellect. You're simply saying, oh, well, you made an error there. You know, it's a very polite and gentle way of doing it. Versus, you know, uh, my opponent is, my opponent's position is uh, a fantasy, right? Which implies that there's some, a specific thing that's wrong about the way he's thinking about things. Or my opponent is an idiot, right? <laughs> Which is a very insulting and rude and confrontational way of doing it. So they would go back and they would come up with, you know, they'd be very excited if they came up with like 30 or 40 different ways. And then I produced my list, which had 288 different ways <laughs> of saying that, you know, all different variations. And uh, that's the, the wonderful thing about the English language, of course, is it's, I think it's the biggest language there, is, there is. I mean, we, we, there's so many different words, so many different shades of meaning. So if we talked about the origin of languages, you're out observing the world, you're observing similarities, you're, you're observing these patterns of similarities out there, and each word is a little, a little note put there to say this pattern and not, you know, uh, differentiate that from all other patterns, keep it in your mind. Well, in English, we've developed the most number of labels for the most finest differentiations uh, of little, of, of, uh, of different meanings and different patterns. So there's this word here and there's this other word that's almost exactly the same thing, but not quite. And it allows us to do this tremendously fine differentiation of, of words from, you know, my opponent is an error to my opponent has, um, what would be a fine differentiation from that? Uh, uh, I, I mean, I, I struggle a little with the, that precise example. Become, one will come to me as I go. But the idea of being able to make these extremely fine differentiations because you have so many different words. And in English language has done this because somebody had a great line once about it that the English language uh, doesn't just borrow words from other languages. It tracks other languages down, knocks them out in the back alley and rifles <laughs> through their pockets. Right? <laughs> so we've got Japanese words, we've got Russian words. And I think tycoon is Japanese. We have Russian words, we have Spanish words, we have Latin and Greek and, and, and Anglo, you know, the original Anglo-Saxon the original Anglo-Saxon core of the language is this tiny little bit and everything else is, is borrowed and, and, and stolen from, from anybody and everybody else. Uh, and it gives us a tremendous, now in denotation versus connotation. So denotation is the exact literal meaning of the word. And so it, it would be the definition of the word or not just the definition, but you know, things that are clearly directly implied in the meaning of the word. So a table, you know, well, uh, uh, a table would be, you know, a flat surface with some kind of supports that you can place things on, right? That would be the denotation of table. Connotation is 
all the different associations, the metaphorical associations, the vague associations in usage, the associations with the sound of the word. So table would come, you know, you, so for, for a fact that you could say, I'm going to table a motion, right? That's a, a word, for, that's a, uh, uh, from parliamentary debate. So, you know, you table a motion, uh, I'm going to put forward something for consideration. That use of the word table in a different context is there as part of the connotation when I talk about a table being in front of me. You know, and that's something you could draw on if you were, if you wanted to sort of make it sound like, you know, in this table before me is, is a proposal, you are drawing on that connotation of tabling a motion, right? Or um, uh, the, the use of tablet, right, as a, a thing on which things are written is also, you know, there's every other word, every other way in which the word has been used in the past, everything that it sounds like, everything that it evokes in the reader's mind is part of the connotation. And that's why there's this tremendous field of using different connotations of different words and how they have different implications when you use them. Um, I want to add one, one thing to what you said about the richness of the English language. I think one way in which the expression power in the English language is dramatically expanded is through idioms. Because not only it rifles, you know, it, it gets steals words from every culture it, it encounters, but it also takes up idioms from every human endeavor that it encounters. Like with advent of railroads, you know, you had, he's going off track, you know, stay on track, his yeah. fire in the belly, you know, it's just, it just goes on, he's just letting off steam. Uh, okay. So it's like, it, it, every experience is kind of converted into an idiom and that gets added. I remember um, a number of times we had to explain baseball uh, idioms to you. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, so I, I don't know what a wicked googly is, but I, you know, so there, you know there's the, the great uh, uh, sort of uh, British English divide there of, of, yes. of, of um, Cricket versus versus baseball because you know the uh, um, uh, oh a guy really hit a home run of that or yep. uh, you know the uh, grand slam you know there there's all these different uh, metaphors from uh, idioms from from baseball that we bring up that are part of the American experience and not part of uh, uh, the other English speaking peoples. <laughs> yes. Um, so, Rob, what I want to do is, um, this is kind of halfway mark for our questions. Mm -hmm. So let's take a couple of questions from the audience, sure. and then we will continue. I'm going to make it possible for people to unmute themselves. So it's going to be Francoisi, followed by Joe, followed by Taylor. Francoisi, go ahead. Um, my question is about uh, between words and writing. Um, how do you make the difference between the content and the form? You know, is it something which come automatically? Is it an art? Is it, you know, uh, there's, there's so much to difference between form and content. How do, can we manage that? <laughs> you mean in terms of writing versus speaking? Both, in both cases, you know, yeah. because uh, it's so important to dissociate the form from the content and most of the time it comes automatically, but if we leave it automatic, we make many mistakes. So I'm wondering from a, a person like you who really um, uh, control language, again, somebody like me who makes so many mistakes, you know, how can we uh, manage that? Well, you know, I find that to be, you know, I think I'm somewhat unusual in that because I'm a writer, I, I'm used to using, you know, words on the internet is basically my medium of expression. Um, that I actually have the trouble going the other direction from writing. I tend to have more difficulty going from writing to speaking because I'm used to the idea that I can, you know, when I'm writing a sentence, I can rewrite it three or four times as I go to make it a little bit better. Uh, and then when speaking, you can't do that. You start a sentence, you have to keep going until you get to the end of that sentence and you only get one chance at doing it. Uh, and so what you end up having to do is you end up having to repeat yourself. You end up having to go back 
and restate something you just stated a minute ago and restate it in a slightly more exact formulation this time, it's a, I find it to be a, a, the challenge there of, of adjusting to that other medium of communicating. Now, communicating by speaking is not something that's extremely difficult for me because we do that face-to-face -face a lot uh, in our normal life. But when it comes to communicating sort of big ideas or a, a connected argument, where I want to be very careful about how and exact about how I do it, I find I have to work a lot harder to do that in speaking versus in writing. Um, but I think, you know, we make the, we do, I think, make the adjustments automatically to some extent. And the great thing that speaking has, for example, that writing doesn't have is, and, and, and on Zoom, I can really see this, I can see you. I, I can see your reaction. I can see when you look at, well, I can see when you smile at something I say because you like it. I can see when you frown because you don't like it. I can see when you look at me like I'm completely nuts because you don't understand what I'm saying. So I can get, you know, we can get this feedback from other people. And it often makes for the ability to sort of use almost a shorthand in speaking. Because you've all had the experience where you start a sentence, you start to say something, and the other person sort of nods like, oh, I get what you're talking about. And you don't have to, you can almost like skip the rest of the sentence or the rest of the sentence can be truncated and said in shorthand because you know the other person already understands you. Whereas in writing, you could never do that because you know the, the lonely part about writing is you know you write something down perfectly, you send it out there, and it goes to people, but you don't get to see them them absorbing it. You, know, you don't get to see their reaction, um, uh, and you know you occasionally get letters and feedback and you know somebody saying it, but you don't get that same. It, it's not as interactive. So um, I think that 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 conditions how we. Uh, adjust to different mediums of expression by using that feedback to say, okay, I need to say more here. I need to say less. Uh, uh, this person doesn't understand me or they do understand me. I don't know if that gets what you were. Okay. Uh, Next, let, let's just go. Uh, there are lots of people who okay. want to question. Yeah. So we'll, we'll just get, uh, you know, just one, uh, no follow-ups. Um, so it's going to be Joe, Taylor, John, and Eric next. Joe, go ahead. Thank you very much for presenting. This has been you know, very enlightening. How do you determine the validity of a metaphor? Ah, well, see, the thing about metaphors is, is you practically anything can be a metaphor. You know, any, that is any metaphor can be valid if you stretch it far enough. <laughs> because lots of things are similar to lots of other things. It's just a matter of, it's just a matter of how far you're stretching the similarity. Um, so I think the thing is with the metaphor, you have to identify in your own mind, if you wanna make sure a metaphor is valid, you have to identify in your own mind what exactly is the similarity that I'm trying to capture here. And then ask yourself, is that a fundamental enough similarity? Is it a strong enough similarity that it doesn't become confused by some other uh, uh, issue. Uh, for example, the great example of this is what the what is usually called the argumentum ad Hitlerum, which is you know that to say, oh well, that's just like what Hitler did, right? And so, and the notorious thing about that is anything can be practically anything can be cited as having some vague similarity to Hitler. Like Hitler was a vegetarian, right? So does it mean that if you're a vegetarian, you're like Hitler? Right, that would be the, the metaphorical. And of course, we see this all the time in, in our current discussion because uh, comparing, a, comparing the other guy to Hitler when you disagree with him is, is the go-to thing. You know, if you've ever been on Twitter, that's like the go-to thing where you know, Bush is just like Hitler. And of course, George W. Bush was not just like Hitler. Uh, there's no real comparison there. That's a, a metaphor that was clearly invalid. But you, know, you can see somebody could say, well, Hitler started a war. And so George W. Bush started a war, so therefore George W. Bush, w. Bush is like Hitler. And so, uh, you know, you actually, if you're going to describe somebody as being like, like Hitler, they actually have to be like Hitler in some fundamental and important way. Or, you know, if you're going to describe somebody as being like the Nazis, they have to be like the Nazis in some really significant way that's not overwhelmed by all of the big differences. Um, so, okay. for example, um, I mean, somebody... So the, one of the things about this is, you know, Godwin's law, right? Uh, the guy on the internet, uh, Mike Godwin, coined this idea that the first person to compare his opponent to Hitler automatically loses the argument, 
right? Because it's, it's such a lazy thing to do, that if you had to go to that lazy chief argument, you automatically lost. Well, he had to go out and um, on, on the internet and give a special dispensation. We had this uh, here in Charlottesville, we had that in 2017, we had these uh, white nationalists coming and doing a rally and saying, no, you can compare these guys to Hitler. <laughs> it's okay to call these guys, to compare these guys to Hitler because they're actual Nazis, right? Mm -hmm. So you actually, you, know, you have to have a situation. It's, oh, the metaphor works if there is a real similarity. Okay, next one uh, is Taylor, John, and Eric. Taylor, go ahead. Hi, Rob. Thanks so much for the thoughtful presentation today. I'm really enjoying this. And um, my question is, um, what the difference is in learning by listening to someone speak or through a conversation as compared to reading. And I'm wondering if our understanding of the content changes and perhaps the role of personality types in um, learning either through listening versus reading. Mm, mm. I don't know about personality types. That's a little, I, you know, somebody have to have really done some work on actually quantifying that. But I, I here's the main difference I find uh, listening versus reading is I find that reading is better. Well, find, first of all, I find reading is faster. Um, I almost never listen to anything. I know podcasts are all the rage. I don't listen to a lot of podcasts. Uh, I don't, I've, I've entirely stopped watching uh, uh, cable TV for a, lo a long time ago for a number of different reasons, but also for the fact that you know uh, speaking and especially television is a low density form of communication, meaning there's not a, you know an hour spent watching television will not give you as much information as five minutes reading a good book, right? So and it's because you can go faster. Uh, you can go more in depth and more precise than you can uh, when you're when you're listening to people talk. Uh, as a general rule, now some people are fast talkers, some people are very dense and informative talkers, which is why I mentioned television as being the worst example of this, because uh, it's often very you know not not a lot of good information packed into a small into in, not a lot of information is packed in there. A lot of bloviating gets packed in there. Um, but so I say, but I said most of my information intake I, is heavily oriented towards reading, uh, going to articles on the internet, reading a long argument because it's so much faster to uh, absorb information. But also for that same reason that it is quote unquote written in stone, it's much more precise. And so you can get a lot more precise information out of it. The huge advantage out of spoken communication and, 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 and somebody speaking is especially when you can interact with somebody is you can get that back and forth and you can ask follow-up questions and you can very much go to, you know, in, in writing, I often have the, I would have really liked to ask the, you know, the experience where I think I would have really liked to ask the person this question over here to see exactly how it would react to a counter argument or to an objection or to some other example that he hasn't dealt with. And when you're able to do that, you can actually, you can get a huge amount accomplished very quickly and get a lot better information because you are, you know, sort of choosing your own adventure. You're, you're, you're steering things in the direction of what's required for your needs, for your information needs. What do I require cognitively, given the state of what's in my own mind, what do I require in order to get this? Uh, rather than, you know, when I, when you're, when I, when you're, when somebody's writing, I'm out there imagining a, um, and I have an imaginary reader in mind. I have it. I have sort of an imaginary ideal average reader, uh, you know, an intelligent layman who I am writing for. But that person is a general a generality. You know, it's a non-specific person. Uh, so I might not pitch it in exactly the way that one person needs given his own his or her own context uh, and or base of knowledge or whatever else. So conversation, the great power of conversation is that ability to have the, the, the context, the, the cognitive needs of one person and the cognitive needs of the other, you know, being able to connect and, and find the common ground there uh, to work on. Uh, next one up is John. John, go ahead. Hi. Um, so I, my question is, uh, uh, how important 
is uh, the art of rhetoric. And I, I'm thinking specifically of the structure of arguments and the concepts of ethos, pathos, and logos in your writing and thinking. Um, I have to say, I do not rely a lot on the sort of traditional concepts of rhetoric as put forward by Aristotle. That sort of thing. I don't, I don't have that in my head very much as a, as a background. Now, if I think about it, I can probably think about how I do fit into to some of that. Um, I, when I'm writing about, when I'm writing my sort of rhetorical mindset in terms of thinking, you know, the rhetoric is how do you put together an argument intended to appeal to a, a reader? And my ideal is to, again, to imagine this sort of ideal or, or um, uh, this generalized reader that I'm appealing to and to imagine given, you know, if, if this is a, a, a sort of an average or normal person, out, I don't say average, but a normal person out there in the world, given all the different ideas that are out there, all the different knowledge that I can expect a normal person to have, I'm trying to recreate what are this person's cognitive needs? What does he need to know at the very beginning in order to get him engaged in the topic and to know where I'm going with, to have some idea of where I'm going with the article, with the argument? Um, what does he need to know next? What does he need to know after that? And I often have, when I do get to see somebody read something I've written and see them react in, in real time, usually it's, it's, it's somebody in my family. Uh, it happens all the time and Sherry will say, oh, but what about X? And I'm like, keep reading, because that's the very next sentence, right? So there's this objection or this counter argument she came up with, well, have you mentioned such and such yet? That's the very next sentence that I've written because I knew she'd be thinking that. I knew somebody, or I knew the reader would be thinking that. That when I mentioned this, you know, this, um, uh, this, this one, I mentioned one issue that that's going to logically bring up a second issue. And so I have to deal with that next. And so I'm always thinking in terms of the, the cognitive uh, needs of the, the, the sort of the train of thought that I'm trying to create inside the mind of the reader, where I'm anticipating what's going to be his reaction at this point? What is he going to need to know next? What is he going to need to know next in order to bring his mind sort of along, guide his mind along with mine onto a path from one step of the argument to the next to get to where he needs to be. Now, ethos and pathos, as I understand them, but it's been a while since I've read, you know, since I've gone back to my Aristotle, is things like appealing to the emotions and appealing to concepts of morality. And I, those I always think of as, as, they're always there and they're very powerful, but they're also sort of secondary because the main thing is what is the train of information, the train of thought, the train of logical connections the person needs to make. And, and so I guess that would be the logos. And, and that's what's in my writing at least, and, and in the writing that I, that I admire from other people, that's sort of what's driving the train and determining what stations we go to. <laughs> okay, next question. Yeah. Is Next question is from Eric. Eric, go ahead. Eric, you need to unmute yourself. All right, hey. Yeah, th yeah this goes back when you were comparing uh, English to other languages. And, and as I said, I think English, you're right, English does have the largest lexicon. And I was just wondering, what is it about languages that make us human and how do we differ as humans because our language differs? Do we, un like you say, table? We have table and, and, it, and it's a concrete, you know, it goes from con conceptual to concrete because we have a table and we make it a concrete thing. Another culture may not have a table or, or, or whatever. Do, do other people, other languages understand the world, not just because they don't have the table or don't have the car, but do they, are their brains wired because they're words are different, their, their, their lexicon is different. You know, it, 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 conceptually, do they get something completely different out of the world than we get? And we get something completely different out of the world than they get. You know, can you, can you answer that? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I, I think that that gets into more into the anthropology of it. And I think that there's been a, from my knowledge of it, there is, there's been a, a really interesting sort of debate about that about how different is it really? Because there were some, um, you know, late 19th century, there were some of the first like sociologists and anthropologists who went out there and they would say, oh, well, I found this tribe in the Amazon and they think of everything, conceive of everything completely differently. And it was a huge engine of, um, 
of, of subjectivity, of subjectivism, yeah, philosophically. And they would say, well, you know, that this, because this tribe has different ways of conceiving the directions of the company, you know, they don't have east, west, north, south. They have, you know, they think in six different directions or something like that. I'm trying to reconstruct in my mind what the examples were. Uh, because they have these different words and these different concepts and could conceptualize the word diff world differently, therefore that shows everything is completely subjective and, you know, uh, we could, you know, there's, there's no objective truth, there's no objective basis for any words that we, and concepts that we use. And that was heavily abused, used and abused. I think it does make a difference, but I also think there, that when you start digging into it, I think you find a surprising universality that amidst relatively superficial differences, like, okay, you have six points in you know, your compass of directions, maybe you have six points instead of four, like we would have. That's a relatively non-fundamental thing. Beneath that, you'll find, I, I think that a lot of the work since then has discovered that the differences are less uh, extreme and less radical than was or, were originally thought. Um, that people actually do conceptualize the world very similarly, uh, despite the differences in language, because they're all we're all interact we are all the same kind of species interacting with the same kind of world. Uh, so uh, I think a little cold water has been thrown on that idea of people radically, you know, their language radically doing it. Now I will say, what I think is is a difference is not so much that somebody would reconceive the world in a totally different way, but that you have more sophisticated concepts that come in and are and, and mold a language. Uh, and a language would become more complex and sophisticated and able to deal with more, com more sophisticated and abstract ideas. And I think, you know, so let me talk about the idea that the superficial differentiations, for example, you know, Germans put their, put their verbs at the end of the sentence. I'm not sure that makes a fundamental difference in how they look at the world and how they act because they have their verbs at the end of the sentence. Now, um, let's go back to that. I, I do think, for example, there's, there can be a differentiation in terms of, and it's usually more within a society, in terms of how individuals use words can definitely shape, it can re both reflect and shape, there's a you know, mutual relationship, reflect and shape their way of thinking about things. So but, uh, one book I recommend that makes that case for how words shape the way you think is a book called Less Than Words Can Save. It was a Richard Mitchell. And he uh, talks about uh, one that I brought out to my kids. My, my son, my oldest son, especially is a, uh, uh, a big World War II history buff. So I, I showed him the part where he takes uh, Churchill's famous, we shall fight them on the beaches, that speech. And we shall fight them on the beaches. We shall fight them in the fields and the mills. We shall never surrender. And it's all this very, we shall, we shall, we shall, repeated. And then Richard Mitchell takes it and rewrites it into bureaucraties. You know, uh, facilities will be maintained at uh, landing, uh, designating landing facilities, and everything's put in, in these very abstract technical terms and written in, pass, in the passive voice. And he says, and if, if, Hitler had, if, sorry, if Churchill had said that in his speech, would people have been roused to go, you know, put out their maximum effort against the Third Reich? Obviously, they wouldn't have. So, in that respect, I think the way you use words um, uh, shapes how you think about things. I think that's probably more powerful at an individual versus an individual level than on a cultural level. Although I, I think there is a case to be made. I think on the cultural level, it's it's not as deep as people used to uh, to say. Um, and one other point, which is now just, uh, again, it's, it's because I'm speaking and not writing, is one of this other point has, has eluded itself, but it may become back to me later. Okay, the good thing is that I have written all the questions down that <laughs> I need to ask you. So what I'm going to do is that now I'm going to shift to my questions. Um, we'll do four more questions, and then we'll go back to, uh, go back to uh, the uh, attendees. So the next question is, how do languages grow? Uh, if you want to answer that with respect to English, like the history of English language and how it has grown, uh, which probably you know know the best. So how do languages grow? Okay, so um, I just actually, this connects to, I just remembered the point I was going to make that I forgot a second mm -hmm. ago. And it had to do with how languages grow. So I think the most important, uh, if you want to talk about how language influences thought, I think the most important thing is the growth of language influences thought. 
So we're talking about English. The English language has like 600,000 words, something like that. And most other languages have more like 60,000 or 30,000. Uh, and if you go back, I mean, you know, this all comes from Indo European, most languages come from Indo European. Uh, there are a few that don't, but a lot of the languages we use today in the world come from these Indo, in, in Europe and in Asia, come from these, this Indo Europe, this one Ur language, this Ur, early language that was used uh, somewhere in Central Asia, you know, 5,000 years ago, that then, or probably like 10,000 years ago, that spread out. And I think it's very fascinating. Idea. One of my favorite theories which turns out to um, not be true, but I, I was one of, the, it's one of those theories I wish was true, was that at about the same time, agriculture comes from Central Asia, from the Black Sea area, and spreads all around the world. And at a roughly the same time, the Indo-European language comes out from that roughly that same area and spreads around the world. And one of the theories was, was it that this was the language of the people who invented agriculture? And so as this technology spread, the language came with it. I thought that was a great, a great theory. I love that theory. It turns out to not have any real evidence to support it. But um, the main thing I see is that when you talk about the Indo-European language, these early languages had very, very, very few words. And uh, the thing that I find fascinating is when you go from a language that has very few words to one and, and probably a fairly not very complex grammatical structure, to a language that has a lot of words and extremely complex grammatical structures. What you're seeing there is not just the growth of the language, you're seeing the growth of the mind. You're seeing the growth of the number of thoughts that people are able to hold in their own minds and to express. So that's where you're seeing the, the, the power of the language to shape people's thought. I think the most important part of that is that as the language becomes bigger, more complex, it creates, brings more words, more different shades of meaning, it expands the range of people's minds in a way that I think is, is very substantial. And how, how does, how do languages grow? Um, well, here I think that the, I, I have certain problems with Richard Dawkins idea of a meme, you know, because he had this idea that a meme is like a gene. It's a unit of knowledge that because it becomes useful, it gets replicated. And so it gets replicated and suddenly it takes over and, and, and you suddenly have changed people's ideas by having this little bit, this little tidbit of knowledge spread uh, evolutionarily. And there's certain problems with that idea because he, you know, he tends to be of the selfish gene uh, uh, thing where the, you know, the gene is the real unit that's being spread, not the human beings who are, who, in whom it's contained. And the, knowledge, the, the meme is the thing that's being spread and not the humans who, who, are, who are using it to think. Um, so I think that, that outlook on it is wrong, but the idea is very correct. And I think that's exactly how, uh, how, I, how a language changes, is that something comes introduced into the language that becomes so useful that people wanna keep using it over and over and over again and keep, and keep developing it. And also, you know, the concept of mutation, right? A, a standard uh, uh, thing of mutation. I, I was very amused a while back I came across I think it's an early note that Ayn Rand was making when she had just moved to America, about how much she hated the, Ameri the way Americans used language. She says, it's not even English, it's not even a language, it's just a bunch of jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because, because wordplay, and you know, of course, if you've read Shakespeare, you know that, that using wordplay and having all these weird metaphorical uses of words is nothing new in English. I mean, Shakespeare did that with tremendous uh, fertility. And you know, you, have all, you find these lists of all the different words that he invented, all the different words and phrases and figures of speech that first appear in Shakespeare. So that sort of fertility of, I think she was upset because she was finding it in America, she found the whole new set that she was totally unaware of before and none of it made sense. And she eventually you know, got over it and she had Frank O'Connor there who was playing baseball uh, to her, things like that. Uh, so, uh, but you know that that's that's the sort of the role of that's the equivalent of mutation in this evolutionary analogy, that people are constantly making plays on words, or trying to kind of clever spins and clever new ways of using words, uh, and then some of those become so useful and so interesting and so you know worthwhile in, in everyday usage. They open up a new idea, or they make it more convenient to say something, or they just provide a new shade of meaning that wasn't there before that people that people thought they wanted. Uh, and so 
it, it spreads from there. And then uh, the language grows. I think, I think the evolutionary approach is the best way to understand how the language grows. Another little uh, tidbit on like growth of language that I found fascinating too is if anybody's ever read Ivanhoe, the novel uh, by Sir Walter Scott, you know, this, uh, one of the great novels of the age of story and, and all that sort of thing. Well, he has that fascinating little observation early on, uh, which I think there is some truth to. It's not just something he made up, where he talked about the, the, how the, uh, the language of, of the English language in the years after the Norman conquest. He says, if you notice that uh, the word for foods changes for foods and animals are different compared, compared to what relationship you have to that food that the word for the food as it appears on the table, as it is served to you, those words tend to be French, like pork. Whereas the word for the same animal as it's out in the field on the hoof, if you're the herdsman who's pushing it around, those words were Saxon, like pig, <laughs> or cow versus beef, beef. Mm -hmm. right? So he's talking about how you can see in the, in the English language, you can see the leftover influence of the Norman conquest that you had the, if you were the Lord and the, the noble, if you were higher up in the hierarchy, you used the French words for things. And if you were lower down in the hierarchy, you used the Saxon word. And we have those French, those French and Saxon words still floating around in the language as the leftover of the collision between those two cultures. Oh, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you a question which I think will be of great interest to everybody, including myself. It's, how do you make a language, your language, your own, you know, to kind of develop in it into an art of expression? Yeah, because yeah. You, you know, you, you've been a wordsmith, you know, you've kind of had to kind of build up your own way of saying things. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how do you make your language an art of expression? Yeah, okay. So this is something I used to talk a lot about in my writing classes is that I, I gave a whole lecture on grammar, right? So, you know, grammar is conceived of as a set of rules and restrictions that you have, you know, that's sort of a uh, common uh, public way of thinking about it is a set of rules and restrictions that you're taught at school and you're supposed to go along with. And it's restricting. The so grammar is not restricting. Grammar is, uh, is your toolbox. Right? If you understand how grammar works and the structure of a sentence and how to put clauses together and, uh, you know, how, how, um, uh, how to connect, how to use punctu different forms of punctuation to achieve different effects. This is your toolbox. It's like a painter's palette. Another great, good metaphor. Reason why mm -hmm. it's like a painter's palette. You know, each 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 grammatical and so it's by way of reconceiving the role of grammar. Is grammar is not a set of rules that you have to follow. It's a set of tools that you get to use. And each one is a paint that uses, that creates a different, or a different kind of brush, or a different color, or a different texture. It's something you can use to create a different effect. So I gave a, I gave a whole lecture on, on, on the neglected importance of the semicolon, and how I love the semicolon, because of all the effects you can achieve with the semicolon. You mm -hmm. know, the, the, un, the unsung hero of, of punctuation. <laughs> or, or a whole discussion about uh, why, for example, in, um, I, was, I was doing a writing course, this is for objectivists, I was doing it. So it's talking about why do objectivists use so many, so why do objectivists so freely use the M dash, right? The M dash is the long dash. So a little, uh, it, it comes from uh, typesetting terminology. An M dash mm -hmm. is a dash that's the width of the letter M. And there's an N dash, which is the width of the letter N. And then there's the hyphen, which is even shorter. Uh, so the M dash, this long dash, and why, why do I had a whole lecture? Why do objectivists use that so much? Because I, you know, I, I have, so I occasionally have to get up in the morning and say, my name is Robert Drzezinski. I am an M dash abuser. Stay on the wagon and, 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 and uh -huh. uh, engage in some temperance in the use of the M dash. Uh, see, temperance. There's a good connotation thing. Right? The temperance uh -huh. is the the, set, the idea of moderation. Also refers to the temperance movement which was for banning alcohol and avoiding drunkenness. Mm -hmm. there you go. Uh, uh, so the, you know, talking about what it is that you achieve by using that dash, because that dash is very interesting. It's a, it's a break in grammar. When you put the M dash there, you're breaking the grammatical structure. You're saying, okay, the grammatical structure that went up to here, forget about that, I'm starting a new one. And so it allows you to do all sorts of things where, um, 
uh, Ayn Rand uses a lot when we have, when she wants to have a long chain of different formulations of the same idea. So she'll have the first formulation, M dash, the second formulation, M dash, the third formulation. Uh, she does this a lot in Gold Speech. And that the M dash allows you to do that, to basically say, you no, know, the technical grammatical term for that is an apposite, right? You're saying this thing is the same, I'm saying the same thing in two different ways. And allows her to say, I'm gonna say the same thing in this one way, and then in a second way, then in a third way, then in a fourth way. But the grammar tells you this is the same idea just being restated. And that gives you this huge amount of information that will help you understand you know, this philosophical point she's making. Because you can understand these are four different formulations, each one becoming either more exact or developing from an, uh, uh, from, uh, an early premise to a conclusion that flows from that. You know, it's, it's, you, so it allows you to say this is you know, the same idea being restated in different ways in a way that, that brings you in some direction that, that, she's, that the author is trying to take you. So that I think that that's why the big thing I say is you, you look at words, you look at grammar, grammatical structure, not as a set of rules or a set of definitions that you have to follow, but as tools to use to create something. Or another maybe different analogy would be, think of it as, as like ballroom dancing, right? There's a certain number of steps that you have that are dictated by the nature of the dance. Each dance has a certain character to it. Um, but then your creativity is by putting those steps together in a certain way and performing them in a certain way, you create an individual dance that's different from any other dance. And you can innovate even, you can come up with a new step that uh, nobody's done before or a new combination of steps that hasn't been done before and come up with something creative. And that's how you give the individual character to it. Now, as to the individual character of my writing, uh, I, I was sort of partly, I would say influenced by it, but it also sort of named for me what I was already doing. But uh, a description Ayn Rand gave to um, the way Francisco Danconia talked. This is a highly uh, uh, educated, literate English, deliberately mixed with slang. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So my, my style is, is sort of being able to go you know, with drawing on my education in philosophy and classics and all that, and you know, you know, being well-read, being able to draw on the highbrow literary illusions and, a, a, and the ability to, to write in a formal style, but mixed in with, deliberately mixed in with informality and a conversational style and you know, references to Star Trek and, and, and other <laughs> things from that would not necessarily be, most people would not necessarily consider high culture. Let me, let me do a follow up. So when you look at your writing, say 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and you're, write, you're writing now, mm -hmm. how is your writing different now as compared to 20 years ago? Well, that's a really good question. I haven't looked at anything 20 years old in a while. Um, I think it's, more fluid and more self-confident now. Uh -huh. uh, just introspectively, I'm thinking that uh, I think I was less, I was, probably, I was probably more formal in my style of writing and less free in my style of writing before because the nature of, of growing older is you become more confident in your ability to say, oh, I can, I can, I can make, I can, I can, I know exactly how to go from this one point over here to this one point over here at the end of the paragraph. I know exactly how to do that and how to get all the little notes I want in between and get the style exactly pitched between serious and, and humorous. I know how to do all that and it's a lot easier now because I've learned so much. Whereas before I think I would have been more cautious and you know, more um, probably more formal and less adventurous in my use of and the use of language and uh, the structure of the language because I would have had less of a sense of here's where I'm skating on thin ice and I'm going to crash. Yeah, no, I, I mean, the, the impression I have um, based on the, your writing that I've been reading for all this time is you were always very clear mm -hmm. um, throughout the entire time. But let's say 20 years ago, you were actually very much concerned about making the point and it was a much simpler structure and you kind of kept, to that structure, now you're able to kind of play with it in the sense that you kind of know what you're saying, you know the field so well, you're able to express it so well. So you are able to kind of move and make a whole range of observations and weave a whole range of thoughts together 
So you can write a paragraph or like, you know, say a newsletter and the range you cover is much, much larger mm -hmm. than what you would do. And you would touch upon many things yeah, I, I and all of them. Yeah. That, that's the impression I get. It's much more richer. That's very good. I think because it's the ability to bring in side ideas that I have. Well, first of all, I have more side ideas, right? Every, every mm -hmm. topic, I have more other unrelated, you know, I have a main idea I want to get across. I, there's more other stuff that I have in my head now than I used to because I know more, right? I've got more years of benefit of experience and thinking and, and um, age, you know, age mm -hmm. has conversations. And uh, so there's more other things I have to say and more of the things I really just dying to get in there. But also I think what I've learned is I've gotten better at being able to bring in a side idea, a side observation without derailing the main point. Yes. Now, one thing I will say is that, you know, the, the, con the continuity there is that I don't derail the main point. And I'm, I've always been very conscious of that. Now, in my writing courses years ago, I used to, I used to beat up a lot in Tom Wolfe. You know, Tom Wolfe, the guy who wrote, uh, you know, Radical Chic and uh, The Right Stuff. And, and he was this journalist, a tremendously entertaining uh, writer. And he, he died a few years ago. And, you know, you, all these people were talking, oh, I love this line he wrote. And it's a very colorful style of, of writing. I always used to beat up on him a little bit as, a, as saying that he, he, he lures writers to their doom because he was so colorful and so funny, but also extremely undisciplined. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he would just say his, his writing was sort of career around, sort of career, excuse me, not career, but career around the page. And mm -hmm. he, would, he didn't always have that sense of clarity of here's a point that I thought through carefully and I'm trying to convey and all this other stuff was on top of that, he would just sort of go with the flow of, oh, here's this, yeah, these crazy ideas running through my head. And so I think he lured the writers to their doom because they would try to, to, to borrow that style. But most of the time, they weren't as funny and interesting as he was. <laughs> and couldn't get away with it, right? Mm -hmm. So when, I, I, I wrote, when he died, I wrote this thing saying, you know, that, that you know, what I would tell the writer who wants to, uh, to copy this is, you know, Tom Wolf could get away with it. You probably can't, yeah. so don't try um, but I think that that it would sort of explain that I'm, I'm able to bring a little bit more of that Tom Wolfism of here's a whole bunch of little crazy angles that I've got and I've thought up and colorful details that I want to bring up. And, but I've been able to do it without letting that, you know, I, 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 I've been able to do it. I've put a lot of effort into making sure that I, I, you know, it's very important to me to do that in a way that doesn't sidetrack me from here's the point I want to make. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to get to the, the bonus question uh, that I was hoping to get to. I think uh, I'm going to skip other questions because it's really interesting. Um, are visual arts and music a broader kind of a language? And what is it that we can learn from visual arts and music to make our language better? Okay, that's a really interesting question. Um, and as you know, music is very important to me. I, uh, I'm very interested in music um, and whatever I say about the visual arts will probably be corrected by Sherry when I get uh, So let's see. I, I think they are languages in a metaphorical sense. And then again, here's a case where we have to be clear about what the metaphor is. So they're languages in the sense that you have a variety of elements that with uh, sort of established uh, elements with, and I won't say established, established is probably the wrong word, elements with objective meanings, meanings that can be understood by other people, that are then woven together to use to communicate something. So they're a language in that sense, but they are very, very different in that they don't have, so what I was talking about how uh, the, the advantage of writing, for example, is it fixes, and language in general and writing in particular, is it fixes the meanings of things. And it puts fixes it to an exact form that you can then look at and objectively evaluate and say, oh, so this is what I was thinking. And well, how, this was the path, this was the path of, of uh, the logical path I followed to get to this point. I could see that because it's all written out. The other arts don't do that. Okay? They're going to keep things in their non exact form. And uh, so, for example, let me, how would I put it? Um, uh, so if, if you notice, a, so humans are pattern recognition machines. And if you notice a pattern and you give it a label and put a word on it, you make it very, you make it very exact. 
and you allow that pattern to be compared to other things, an artist would just take that pattern and say, well, here, here's the pattern. Let me see, yeah, let me show you, let me show you what the pattern looks like. And we can give you the fixed label on it. So that can be enormously useful to give you, here's what this pattern looks like. Here's what this sort of person would be like. You know, so Michelangelo's David, right? Here's what this sort of hero would look like. And suddenly you have an image of it. Um, you know, it's a pattern and it, it, uh, it, he, it, he, he saw patterns in how people behaved, how they acted, how they looked, how they stand, uh, how they hold their bodies. And he took that pattern and then says, I've, I've now put that into a concrete form that embodies this pattern. And I'm going to put up you free, up there for you to look at. I'm picking Michelangelo's day because I figure everybody has an image in their head of what, what it looks like. Um, so he's just giving you the pattern, but he's not giving you a name for the pattern. And he's not telling you anything about the pattern. Uh, and so you're not going to, it's going to be tremendously useful, but not in the same way. Got it. And it's not going to, uh, or musically, I find it, music, I find to be a fascinating thing because, uh, so I'm doing a whole lot of thinking these days about, you know, what is it that music does? How does music, music communicate? And sometimes music communicates in a way that's a lot more like language. So uh, mm -hmm. it takes little snippets of sounds that have, that are more, that are almost like words that have a, have a specific, have a very clear specific meaning that's, that's agreed upon by social dimension. So uh, I've been wanting to do something uh, sometimes soon about uh, the 1812 Overture, Tchaikovsky. Mm -hmm. da, 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 heard this on the radio on the way here. Uh, the fascinating thing about that piece of music is practically every measure of it has a very specific and clear meaning that most people don't get because we're not Russian and we're not like, we're not 19th century Russians. Hmm. So that, you know, if you were a 19th century Russian, you'd recognize all these snippets of music and recognize what they're supposed to be. So, the, you know, like one of them is a, a hymn, a, a Russian folk, uh, one of them is a Russian folk song, which represents the, the Russian people rallying to the support against the, the you know, it's about the, Napoleon's invasion of 1812. So one of them is about as a Russian folk song, which if you were Russian, you would recognize it's about this virtues of the simple Russian people rallying to the cause. Uh, another one is a, a religious, a, a Russian patriotic religious hymn, as that's evoking religion as a guard against this, these Napoleonic invaders. Then you have snippets from the Marseillaise uh, representing the French advance, and then you have this, which represents the Russian army. And, you know, so if you follow it along, there's all these different things. You're understanding exactly he's telling a narrative of here's this story of the, the French invading. They get to Moscow. They use their cannons against us. They lose their cannons. We use the cannons against them. That's what the cannons are doing there. Uh -huh. And then they retreat. And, and uh, uh, there's this bell ringing, which basically says, like, God himself intervenes in a miracle to make the Russian, uh, to protect Holy Mother Russia. And there's this whole very exact story he's telling by using agreed upon elements. And that's very much more like a language. Mm -hmm. But then music, that is another form of music, which is usually called pure music or something like that, which is there's no narrative element like that. There's no tune that has a meaning just because of people's associations with it, where it's the interaction of the notes and the relationship between the notes that you know, whether it's consonant or dissonant, whether, you know, the, the harmonic relationships, that's what, that's, you know, whether the, the, it has perception of, of psychological perception of going up or down, whether it's major or minor, all those things, that, that's what's conveying the meaning. And that's very different from, uh, from language in the sense that it, it's more, it's different from prose, it's closer to poetry. Because poetry works by not just conveying the literal meaning of the words, but also by bringing images into your mind and causing something, an experience to happen in your mind from the juxtaposition of images and sounds. And that's what more uh, that, that kind of music is like, that it's a language, uh, it's more like poetry where it's, it's evoking emotional reactions or experiences of consonants and dissonance, mental consonants and dissonance in your, in your mind, and then conveying what it conveys by producing a series of experiences in your brain, rather than by conveying information. Wonderful, that was great, that was great. So now we'll go back to questions from, um, from everybody. So it's gonna be Joel, Crystal, and 
Sanjay next. Joel, go ahead. Uh, Joel, you need to unmute yourself. Done. Uh, you ha I haven't heard a lot about listening. What do you think about listening? And uh, what do you think about reading? Listening. And reading. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I talked a little bit about that earlier, but I'd like to say, say more about it. Um, listening. In one sense, I find listening to be a more passive experience. And so I sometimes find it's, it can be harder to gather information. Although I think maybe that with, now that I say it that way, I think that maybe listening has to be in a way is more demanding because in order to follow what, because it's not, because what I'm saying is not written down and you can't go back and check on it. It actually requires a higher level of concentration on the part of the listener to be actively putting together what I'm saying as I'm saying it. You see what I mean? And, and to, to, um, to be actively integrating it together to make sure that you understand what I'm saying. And I think it's also more demanding in one respect, which is that you have to process everything as it goes. You can't pause me. I mean, if you, if you had me record it, you could pause me. And that, yeah, that's, that's always a nice thing to have. But if in a conversation like this, you can't pause what I'm saying and say, wait a minute, let me absorb what you've, what you've already said before I go into the next thing. Listening, properly listening, I mean, really getting something out of listening is a tremendously demanding discipline because you have to be always processing what the person's saying as he's saying it, drawing the meaning out of it, and then being ready to move on immediately to whatever the next sentence is or whatever the next uh, stage of the argument is. Uh, so uh, listening and especially listening to somebody who actually has, you know, a lot to say uh, is very demanding. Now I sort of, poo-pooed the idea of, of watching television and all that sort of thing earlier as a source of information. Um, because I think a lot of what is, uh, a lot of what's out there in terms of, especially on cable news and things like that, is not very enlightening. And you know, you know it's more performance art uh, uh, than it is uh, the conveying of information. But I think listening just to a really interesting conversation or to a very good interview or a podcast or something like that, uh, it has that peculiarly, peculiarly demanding element to it of having to be very active in your, you know, it, it seems like a passive thing. Somebody else is talking and you're listening, but you have to be very active minded in order to be processing it and understanding it and staying engaged with it and ready to move on to whatever the next thing is as it's going. Whereas, you know, the advantage of, of reading is the fact that you can you know, you can pause and rewind and you can go very much at your own pace. And it's why I prefer it for something that's very, some things that are very exact and demanding as I, I really prefer reading. That's why I prefer writing as well, because, you know, as the writer, I'm constantly pausing and rewinding on my own writing and going back and uh, my, my, my son has, uh, my son has started doing the annoying thing of watching me over my shoulder as I'm writing. Uh, which makes you very self-conscious as a writer. So it, it, I always tell them, please don't do that. I know you want to read this. I'll send you, I'll, I'll let you read this when it's done. Please don't do it while I'm writing it because it makes me very self-conscious. But uh, they'll also sort of comment on how I'm writing something and I go back and change it and I change it again and I change it again. And I'm doing that as the writer. And then my hope is that you as the reader will also be able to go back when you're reading it and go back and pause and rewind and say, and think about why did he use this word instead of that other word, which you can do in reading because you're going at your pace, you know, the pace that you need to, to absorb it and analyze it and think about it. And so I think you can get ultimately more out of it uh, in reading. Okay, next up is Sanjay. Sanjay, go ahead. Sanjay muted. Uh, Sanjay, can you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so uh, first, I just want to make a quick comment. I mean, I thought the um, the example with Tchaik Tchaikovsky and and uh, uh, the interpretation of art um, as as language was was fantastic. 
And I, I um, believe that all art is referential either to other art or to history. Um, and so art only works um, as a language only if we know what it refers to. So that was a fantastic interpretation. Um, I have a quick question, I think. Um, I think it'll be quick to answer. Uh, so um, I believe one of the most important functions of language is to teach us um, collective human knowledge um, to the next generations. And one way to maximize this is to, um, to use uh, a language uh, that's uh, common to all, um, common to everybody. So for example, in science, we use uh, mathematics as a, as a very important universal language. So my question really is, why haven't we moved toward a, um, a universal language, for example, Esperanto, um, especially given that Esperanto would, would be one of the easiest languages to learn, um, at least for half of the planet. Well, actually, I, I would say, if, so one, one thing to sort of mention briefly on that, the music thing is one, the type that they have music being a language and you have to understand what it refers to. That's one of the reasons why one of the projects I'd love to do, I don't have time for it yet, I'm gonna to try to squeeze it in, is I wanna do a sort of a, some sort of podcast or something on classical music because I think that people, I think you know, classical music is obscure to a lot of people because they don't understand the language that's being used. And I think it's, it's possible to explain that in a way that people really get and we get a lot more out of the music. Uh, things like the 1812 Overture, what are all the different parts, but also you know, the more abstract form of music as well. So I'm, that will come at some point. I want to do something on that. Uh, but as for a universal language, I think we have a universal language, or at least we're moving towards one. Uh, and Srikant would, uh, uh, you know, anyone who's from India would probably know the role that English language plays there. How many languages are there in India? It's like 500 different languages in India. Yes, yes. The only, only way, only reason Indians can talk to each other is that all of them know English. <laughs> and yeah, so that's like the, the, you know, whatever you say what you will about the British Empire, the one thing it did is it gave a lingua franca. I, um, I, the, I mean, that's Latin, Latin served that role in Europe uh, 2,000 years ago or 1,500 years ago. And it's kind of the lingua franca, the language of the Franks was Latin. It was the common language used all throughout Europe for educated people. Uh, and English came to India and gave that common language there. Um, it's, uh, I, I also had a experience a while back, there was a, a fellow who was um, translating some of my articles into Hebrew and publishing them at an Israeli website. And another Israeli friend of mine said, well, I don't understand why I bothered doing that because every educated Israeli speaks English. Right, so if there is, English is sort of working as, working its way towards being something of a universal language uh, uh, for, you know, for the communication ideas across the globe. Now it's not there yet because it's early days. Um, actually one of my favorite concepts out there was somebody did a study on something they called gross language product. And that was like the, the you know, similar to gross national product. This is a gross language product. It was the amount of economic activity that takes place among people speaking different certain different languages. So English, Chinese, French was up there, German was up there, and Italian actually was surprisingly, uh, surprisingly strong. Uh, so, you know, say somebody's done studies about how commerce and the spread of commerce throughout the world has impacted what languages people use. Because, you know, if, you know, one of the advantages in India has is that people there speak English, and that allows them to connect to the entire English speaking uh, economy. And so that increases the gross language product of English as a language uh, and then, you know, puts it in competition with other major languages that have a large gross language product. And I think that's, you know, that's going to be a fascinating thing to watch unfold as, as things go forward is that the role of commerce as a way of spreading uh, uh, more universality in terms of language, that everybody learns a certain language in order to plug into some part of the, some major part of the global economy. Okay, excellent. Uh, normally what we do is that we do breakout rooms at this time, but it's a little bit late. So what we're going to do is that we're going to just jump directly over to takeaways. So I'm going to just go around and uh, ask people what were their takeaways. You can take between two to three minutes talking about what you got from this meetup. 